And so I closed my practice and now I have had the great privilege and honor of seeing what it looks like when um, folks doctor themselves in community with others um, and with, you know, that energy of accountability, inspiration, and really an encoding uh, in a field of belief that I jokingly refer to as a rebrain, <laughs> rebrain right? So it's like really deprogramming that which we come to our struggles with and recognizing that there is an entirely different field you can step into. It's so much easier when you surround yourself with people who are already being that way. Okay, welcome back to Reconditioned with me, Lauren Vaknin. So today's episode really meant a lot to me. Recording it meant a lot to me. Kelly Brogan is one of my ultimate expanders. I won't use the word idol. I don't believe in idolizing other humans, but she's an expander for me in what I can do for my body and my mind, how I can live from my absolute truth and how I can embody and empower myself through my sexuality and just through my truth and through being me. I've wanted to speak to her for so long, but I'm really glad it happened now because I would have spoken to her during the whole pandemic thing and that would have been our focus and it would have been very much kind of us having a rant about governments and we've both kind of moved on from that. So this was powerful for so many reasons and I'm excited for you to listen to all the incredible stuff we spoke about in terms of healing the mind, healing the body, sovereignty over your mind, having that patient doctor relationship with yourself and what it takes to leave the world of allopathic medicine and what it took for her as a psychiatrist. And she is, she trained and she's got these amazing accolades and you'll hear all about it in her bio and has now created this incredible protocol based on everything she knows about psychiatry but healing psychiatric conditions and challenges with a holistic approach, a complete holistic approach. And the timing of this has worked out perfectly and is so serendipitous because Kelly has just opened registration for her signature program, which is called Vital Mind Reset. Now, Vital Mind Reset has helped countless women who were told they were crazy or they felt they just had to succumb to a life of depression or a life on medication. Those were the only options. You either have the depression or you go onto these medications that maybe don't feel right to you, doesn't feel like your truth. And that's what you have to do. And this course, this program has healed hundreds of people naturally, fully. Honestly, if you want to heal your mind with a holistic approach, which everyone should be doing, because if you're not following the steps she outlines, it's going to be very hard to reach a place of long-term, solid, positive physical and mental health. If you want to do that, check out this course. The information for it is in the show notes. When we're hoping for someone else to fix us, and this is what we spoke about in this episode, we're waiting for medication changes or the doctors to tell us what to do. It is never going to achieve long-term homeostasis. Now, this is not a dig or a judgment on anyone who has taken that route because I know when you are at your rock bottom and I've been there with my physical health and I have had a taste of what depression might feel like, a taste and really not anything that, you know, a lot of people go through. But I know that it feels like you're at your wit's end and you would do anything. Let this be your anything. Kelly's entire body of work is about reclamation. It is about sovereignty, taking back our power. If we suffer from depression, anxiety, psychiatric conditions, anything related to the mind, Kelly Brogan is the one to teach you how to do it. And she used this exact protocol in her psychiatry practice to help patients heal without medication. As she says in the episode, without a microgram of medication, or she used it to allow them to prepare to come off their medications with huge success. And it's also really relevant for any other health conditions like thyroid disorders or autoimmune, or just if you want to optimize your health. So go to the show notes, check it out. Honestly, like I've said, for most health conditions, but really if you're suffering with anything in your mind, depression, anxiety, psychosis, you know, right up to the the really, really bad stuff, postpartum depression, go and check this out. The link is in the show notes. It is also in my link tree in my on my Instagram. If you are listening to this in real time, it will be there for a week. Otherwise, head to the show notes. It will stay there. Although the registration closes after a week. So I guess if you're not listening to this in real time, you'll have to wait till it next opens. Anyway, listen to this episode. You'll hear for yourself what an authentic 
authority this woman is on healing the mind. And I can't wait to hear what you think about it and to just share this and her gift with the world. Okay, as usual, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to dedicate to your growth and your healing just by being here. Because by being here, you are already creating expansion in your life. Just by being here, you are already expanding your mind and your knowledge and putting yourself into a place of growth and healing. So I want to thank you for that because by doing that, you are one more person who is helping to heal the collective. So thank you. As usual, if you enjoy this episode, please share it with friends or family or anyone you think can benefit from it. And of course, feel free to rate the podcast. Kelly Brogan, MD, is a holistic psychiatrist, author of the New York Times bestselling book, A Mind of Your Own, Own Yourself, the children's book, A Time for Rain, and co-editor of the landmark textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She is the founder of the online healing program, Vital Mind Reset, and the membership community, Vital Life Project. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a BS from MIT in Systems Neuroscience. She has specialized in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. So like not much there really, just 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 a few little accolades, right? <laughs> really just a mountain of debt actually. <laughs> right, yeah. That's what I think of when I hear that list. <laughs> really, is that... You, you don't kind of feel, and I mean, because I know that obviously you've left the medical world and stepped outside of the medical paradigm. And I want to go into that a bit. But do you feel like that about all your kind of accolades? It's interesting, you know, because it feels so much like a past life at this point. Um, and it's not that I am not that woman, right, who specialized in medicating pregnant and breastfeeding women herself, you know, I am still that woman. It's just the, the journey is so uh, dramatic for some of us that we occupy these different polarities and it's, it just feels so remote to imagine, you know, waking up at four in the morning and showing up for my surgery rotation as a medical student. I mean, who was that woman who did that? You know, like it's, it's an incredible um, process, you know, to, to grow and evolve in this way. Absolutely. And I'd like to hear more about that for those who don't know about your work yet, but I always start by asking the same question. So let's start there. Uh, and this will be an interesting one with you. What have you done so far today to support your wellness? Oh, it's so interesting you should ask that because I, I revisited once again that for me, movement and specifically dance is, is non-optional. I don't know if you're feeling this, but in the past, I would say like two or so weeks, I've been in this very secular energy, like business and finances and, you know, organizing my utensil drawer and like, just like very sort of like in the dense realms. And that can be very addictive, you know, where you can start to stray from basic self-care, um, mm -hmm. feminine practices, I would say that are really what sustains your energetic, uh, resources and your, your, your sort of, um, the, the grounds for attraction in your life. And so I spent about two hours um, dancing this morning and I hadn't yesterday. Um, the day before I just did like stretching kind of a thing. So it had been maybe like, let's say three days. And I said to myself, I said, listen, note this, note how different your entire day feels today. Like the whole thing feels like it's unfolding in a different um with a different spaciousness. And so for me, that was a big part of my morning so far. I have a pole in my house, so I make up little choreography and I'm in my, you know, stages of, of, uh, progress, which sometimes is really exhilarating and sometimes is really uh, challenging, um, with that particular, um, movement practice. I, well, you've literally been my expander for starting pole dancing, which I, I'm Amazing. yet to start, but I'm booked Amazing. in. Um, and I'm very excited for it. And one of my clients as well has done that because of your I videos. So I, I want to get into that after because I really want to talk about kind of embracing the feminine and all of that great stuff that you so eloquently talk about. Let's go back for a moment. Um, for those who, there will be a lot of people listening who do know who you are. For those that don't, um, you just started talking about kind of seeing that part of you and those polarities of who you used to be and who you are now. 
take us through who you were, who you were, but what it was that you did and what kind of shifted that for you and where you're at now. Mm. So I am, I always think it's an important bit of context that I'm a uh, second generation. My mom is Italian. Maybe it's not, I don't know, but I was raised in a certain kind of um, ethos that was very masculine and very, you know, do it, fix it solutions, get the money, do the thing. It was like a force and will based culture that I think was, of course, you know, the zeitgeist of the time that is amazingly and thankfully shifting right now. And so, you know, my grades um, were only to be A's or A pluses, you know, I was only to become a doctor or lawyer or like, you know, finance person, you know, those were the only three options. And so I never had any intrinsic relationship to, uh, what it is that I was doing, which is why when you read off my bio, no, I don't have a real feeling of like, wow, I did that. You know, I created that. No, I don't actually. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> that happened, you know? So the experience that I had of um, going to college was really marked by the calling that began. And it began when I was working a suicide hotline. I was at MIT and I uh, had the, the intimate exposure to my own emotional um, immaturity, I guess. Like I was up close and personal with how undeveloped I was as an emotional being. And so what would happen is I would interact with people who were in states of crisis and it would be so intolerable to my nervous system that I literally, you know, in many ways, uh, created a, a specialization as a student uh, out of getting them to the solution, right? So of course, in that model, it was getting them to the, connected to the psychiatric department or the mental health um, department in, on campus. And I felt like, okay, this is what we do when things feel bad, right? We get people to doctors, we get them medications. It's all good. Everything is safe. Everything is okay. And so from there, I, I specialized in psychiatry. That's why I went to medical school and, you know, blood, sweat, tears, trauma, and debt, you know, later, a decade later, um, I further specialized in, as I mentioned, medicating pregnant and breastfeeding women. So that was my chosen specialty. And I was one of the first 300 reproductive psychiatrists internationally who began to bring um, pregnant women into the consumer pool of psychotropics. And of course, I didn't do that for nefarious reasons and I didn't do it to make a big you know, profit. I did it because I thought that was how to help women. I saw that they were struggling and suffering. I saw that they you know, were going into pregnancy or coming out of it um, really bereft of resources to help support them once that worked, right? Because I wasn't going to think that therapy was going to work, right? Like real resources. What do you really do to help someone, right? And in that, you know, in that rubric, it's really only the allopathic model, right? It's, it's medication and, and worse. I mean, I trained in a, um, in a, in a hospital system with 13 locked units and compulsory electroshock therapy, you know, and, people who were injected with, you know, medications and neuroleptics against their will. I mean, people have no idea uh, how dark psychiatry can get. And it's all good people just showing up to their job, right? So it's it's a system and it's, it's in many ways, you know, pyramidal in nature and um, the hows and whys of its development and its history are not even germane to the everyday doctor's experience. So it's a lot of harm and injury is done in the name of helping people. And that, that's really the paradox. I mean, it's actually what goes on. I mean, having been that person and being this person now, I, I've been inside, you know, inside the cult, if you will. So it wasn't until I had my own opportunity to become a patient um, that I had this rupture, right? So I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, postpartum my first pregnancy, I was a fellow. Um, so post-residency specialization, and I didn't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life. Like somehow that was fine for my thousands of patients, but not for me. I didn't want to do it. And maybe it's because I was lazy or just didn't want to deal with it. Or maybe it was because my soul was following like the next breadcrumb, right? Like after that, that um, volunteering at that hotline, like this was the next one. And I had a, a choice point. Um, 
And this is what cognitive dissonance is all about, right? Where your lived reality, your lived experience presents you with irreconcilable dimensions, right? And so what happened was I put my condition into full and now many got a decade, almost and a half of remission. Um, and I had to make sense out of that. So I could have, which many do who stay in the system, dismissed it as an anomaly or said, you know, I was going to resolve anyway. And it had nothing to do with changing my diet, which is essentially what I did at that point. Um, and of course, I also began to change my belief system through the scientific literature, because at that point I was not interested in energy, you know, and when even the concept of belief was not really relevant, the placebo effect as an idea was something that you just kind of dismissed as like a nuance of medical research and literature. So it wasn't because of anything that would be considered psycho-spiritual that I began to shift my, um, my paradigm. It was literally because I was very angered. <laughs> I was actually pretty pissed when I saw that I was able to put this into remission and I had never been taught in my training that any of the changes that I made were relevant and that this could be put into remission, right? I never learned that an autoimmune condition could be put into lasting remission, otherwise known as healed, right? And so I was really angry for whatever reason. I would had like a righteous indignation. Um, of course, now I understand what some of the reasons related to how I parentified this system and I felt betrayed by it. And um, it was it was really through the vector of that anger that I tore into the research and the literature and I began to substantiate what it was that happened in my body and why. Um, and concurrently I changed my private practice. So I stopped medicating, uh, patients. I never started a patient on medication again to this day. And uh, I began to see, okay, well, what does it look like then, <laughs> you know, when somebody has insomnia or UTI or bronchitis, or when they have pneumonia or when they have, you know, uh, paranoia or when they have, you know, inability to concentrate or they can't get out of bed or what happens when they're suicidal? What happens? What does it look like? What is the natural course of this human experience? And why might this happen, you know, in one person's life versus another? Is there any meaning or is it all just random badness? And that's, I guess, where my atheistic underpinnings started to shake loose. And I began to develop a more um, a spiritual worldview that, you know, continues to evolve to this day, but is predicated on the inherent meaning in all of the experiences that we would otherwise label as a suffering. And so that's a lot of the, the work that I do these days is to try to um, really help, help folks to, to work with that um, experience of resistance to what is and work with that specifically through um, the experience of the body and health and illness and symptoms. And many, many of the categories that get left out of the spiritual conversation when it is being had, you know, about money or sex or other things, like it also applies to to the body and your experience of of you know illness and and wellness. So, what does it look like when someone comes to your clinic and they're suicidal or they're suffering from depression? What does your treatment plan actually look like without medication? So, I um, have since closed my practice. So, I no longer see patients. It's been about two years. And so, the reason that I did this um, was because I started to. So, when I stopped prescribing, I started to take people off of medication sketch. I'm remembering back. It was such a horrible period of my life because I just started taking them off. Right. So I said, okay, these are toxic. I've done the research. You know, these medications are not doing what I thought they were doing. And they're setting you up for recidivistic illness that's just going to become chronic and you wouldn't have had it otherwise. And, and a lot of my research was predicated on Robert Whitaker's um, books. And he is a, essentially an investigative journalist whistleblower who um, made the very, very um, compelling case through non industry funded literature that medications actually perpetuate disability, mm -hmm. right? So what they purport to resolve, they actually propagate, create, you know, sustain. Mm -hmm. And I became convinced of that, still am. 
Um, and so when I started to take my patients off of medication, I learned about how habit forming these, these chemicals are. I was shocked. I was essentially running like an, an outpatient rehab facility from, a, you know, a, a midtown Manhattan office. And that is when I, I, I don't know, I guess it's interesting to reflect on it, like how cosmically this occurred to me, but I said, okay, well, maybe what I did to, to heal myself is relevant to these patients. You know, maybe if we send their systems a signal of safety before the medication taper, maybe that will work. And you know what? It did. <laughs> and it does. And that is where my uh, protocol came from. It's what I did that I operationalized in my practice. And it's a month protocol. And women would come to me and they would not touch one microgram <laughs> of their dosage until the end of the month. And the month is a go big or go home moment in your entire life. It's meant to be done one time. And so they would go do this month protocol. And I was a little scary at the time. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I still am. I don't know. But you know, it was like, don't even think about coming back. If you had like a crumb of gluten. Okay. <laughs> like, so it was, it was serious. So I really saw, okay, when you dedicate to this, like the ritual that's going to save your life, what happens? And that is um, when everything shifted for me because I started to see quote unquote miracles uh, come out of my office. And in the space of months, um, I started to see women who'd been on multiple medications for decades, um, medication free. And then I started, the years would go by and I would say, well, they're still medication free and they don't even need me anymore. And maybe they don't need any doctors anymore. And because of course, in this process, the, the relationship to the doctor, right? Allopathy would evolve, right? And so they wouldn't run to the doctor for a UTI. They wouldn't run to the doctor for, you know, a cough. It was just an entirely different way of relating to symptoms in the body that was incubating in that space. Um, then my wait list grew, you know, to two years. And I said, okay, this is not brain surgery I'm doing in here, right? Like this, you could literally do this on your own. Um, and so that's when I, um, developed, I wrote my book and I developed vital mind reset, which is this protocol. And that was really interesting because then we got to see, okay, well, what happens if Kelly is not involved dyadically, right? If it's not a Dr. Brogan one-on-one, -on -one, what happens then? And that was very humbling because the outcomes that we have out of the program started to make the outcomes for my practice pale in comparison. And that is, I think I, I rode a zeitgeist of shifting out of the master student, you know, the guru, um, follower and the doctor patient paradigm, right? Some in the yoga community, it's called like the Piscean era, right? Like we're, we're, we're leaving that and we're moving into this experience of being reminded, you know, what we already know and being supported in our process of self-reclamation. And that's why I think coaching, you know, has become so prevalent uh, at this moment, because that like that kind of peer to peer mentorship is a much better fit when you are in the process of individuating from so many of your childhood programs that are really reinforced by a model that puts a big authority out outside of you and insinuates that you don't actually you can't do the thing without the big authority. Right. So I started to feel like the whole model that I was engaged in, even though my practice was predicated on giving my patients the power, the whole model was done. Um, and so I closed my practice and now I have had the great privilege and honor of seeing what it looks like when um, folks doctor themselves in community with others um, and with you know that energy of accountability, inspiration, and really an encoding uh, in a field of belief that I jokingly refer to as a rebrain, rebrainwashing, right? So it's like really deprogramming that which we come to our struggles with and recognizing that there is an entirely different field you can step into. It's so much easier when you surround yourself with people who are already being that way, right? And so that's what these transmissions are about. Like you get in front of energetically somebody who's already being the way you'd like to be and it it will happen for you. It it already starts to happen the moment you choose to get in front of them. 
And so the accelerated nature of these transformation stories, I mean, every time I, I watch a video testimonial, I cry. I mean, every single time. Um, I mean, it's even hearing your story, you know, before we started, I was like, it's just, I live for these stories. And part of it is like the rebel in me, right? It's like the provocateur. It's like, you know, these, these don't exist in that, in that model that I trained in. And um, it's a little bit of a like, hmm, you know, I'm like sticking it to them kind of a thing. <laughs> it's a little bit in me that's, that enjoys it. And it does make you wonder why, because you don't often hear these stories in allopathic medicine, which makes you wonder why are more people not looking to the alternative of allopathic medicine when we see these stories outside of that paradigm? Well, there's something in allopathy called M and M, right? Morbidity and mortality, and it's basically like a meeting that's held um, typically in an internal medicine or, or related um, rotations, where you basically like dissect something that went wrong. Um, there's no equivalent for, you know, the incredible case of somebody who healed, right? Like there's there's no paradigm for that because it's not on offer there. And that's one of the most important concepts, I think, that I have come to elucidate. I call it buying eggs from the hardware store, right? It is not on offer through the allopathic system to resolve your illness, to understand the why, to get to the root cause driver. It is not on offer to heal. It's simply not. Nobody's selling that. You don't go to a doctor for that. What's on offer is management and symptom mitigation. If what you want is to manage your symptoms and hopefully lessen them chronically, you know, over time, yeah, that's for sale there. And the reason that they, the, everybody in their heart wants secure, right? They want remission, they want healing. I mean, who would ever shop for the mitigation model? Nobody, right? So when you go within your heart, like, wow, I, I know there's a life without this experience awaiting me and maybe even a better one, you know, than, than what I, I entered into this experience with. And you go to your conventional doctor, there is this energy of wanting something that's not available there. Mm -hmm. And if that reminds you of anything, <laughs> it's childhood, right? So, so wanting the love from the place that it's not available. That is what characterizes the victim consciousness field. It's what characterizes our woundology. It's what characterizes our habits and patterns of struggle until and if we are ready to adult. And when we're ready to adult, we have a sober experience of being able to look in the face of that which we so hoped, wished, and longed would come rescue us, save us, and make it better. And to see, wow, not happening. Not happening. Okay, so what are my choices? What can I do right now? And that is when you re-engage your native power um, and you commit. You commit to something that it often involves courage, right? Because it's the wild unknown. It's, it's the different thing than you would habitually do to re-experience that same emotional field of disappointment, of self-pity, of resentment, resentment or frustration, um, you know, sadness, grief, shame, whatever it is that comes with struggle. And this, you don't have to be chronically ill. I mean, this is like the average person who is just going to the unfulfilling job in the stale marriage, feeling like a shitty parent every single day, struggling with money in survival mode. I mean, this becomes a a milieu that we saturate ourselves in. It's so familiar and it honestly meets needs. So victimhood meets primary needs in an indirect way. And when you're ready, you learn to meet your needs in a direct way. And, you know, taking the reins um, of your desires sounds like, oh, well, that's great. Who wouldn't want to live a desire-based life? Well, none of us do actually, right? It's, it's been coupled with um, all sorts of danger right? To, to pursue what you want, to allow that aliveness to course through you and guide you and to actually live with all the things that you ever, you know, um, dared to wish for. That's never been uh, framed to your nervous system as something that would be safe. 
So there's a whole rewiring that can happen. And it can happen, I think, honestly, overnight. I've seen it happen overnight. And then it becomes a practice um, over time. And that's what I've seen um, unfold through the portal of this experience of illness. Um, and, and so when you say like, why do people still go there? Well, because they're a match, right? Like I, they're a match to that. I mean, I was a total match. My, I, all I thought was victim thoughts. For me, no fair blaming, condemning, judging. How do I make this happen? You know, control and will. It's very, you know, sort of like the, the coupling of um, masculine energy with a core woundology. I mean, that's characterizes much of what, what's going on in the world today. And so I was, I was a match to that system. And then I kind of vibrated out, you know, and I bounced out and I spent a lot of time in this like mixed state, you know, like the chrysalis state of the caterpillar metamorphosis where, you know, I was giving birth to faith and trust and an experience of um, valuing how I felt, um, valuing my body signs and, and signals. Uh, and then it would still get scared. Right. And I would still not have the thing I want and get upset about, you know, and I was, I was still vacillating. And, you know, now I think for many of us, we're, we're getting to a place where it's like, okay, when do I act? And when do I trust, right? When do I cultivate a feeling state that is enjoyable and pleasant to me? And, you know, when do I take inspired moves and really get going? Um, that dance, that play of masculine and feminine energies is something that really only becomes available to you after your Maslow's hierarchy, you know, pyramid starts to fill up and your, your basic needs, um, your body feels comfortable. You have a basic routine and ritual every single day. You know, you've, you've begun to examine and get real about the things in your life that are just not working. You know, where are you trying to buy those eggs from the hardware store of your life? And and you're taking small steps, maybe every single day, or maybe one day you put it on the calendar, and that's the day you're going to take the, have the difficult conversation, and you're moving in the direction of a more expressed version of yourself. But it starts with that fundamental recognition that the way you were doing it is not going to work. <laughs> kind of that simple. Okay, so one of the challenges I hear from you guys the most is how hard it is to drop into meditation or even to relax and just feel calm. And you know I speak a lot here about how our bodies have not evolved to manage the level of stress we're faced with today, which means we're constantly in fight or flight mode with our sympathetic nervous systems always activated, which we know leads to depression and anxiety and also chronic health problems. If we want to be well, we have to find ways to mitigate this we have to do that ourselves and I believe in merging natural daily practices with the kind of health tech that enables us to counter and mitigate the challenges that modern life throws at us and the Sensate is one of those products and I want to tell you about it. So the Sensate is a small palm sized device that sends infrasonic waves through the chest in order to activate the vagus nerve and calm the autonomic nervous system which is the body's command center. Together with the specially composed hemispheric audio within the app, you will literally feel calmer after only a short session. I give this to anyone I'm with if I have it on me, which I usually do, and everyone has the same response. It's amazing and I already feel less stressed and where can I get one? Now I'm particularly recommending the Sensate to anyone who suffers from anxiety and wants to help calm the nervous system, those who want to deepen their meditation practice, and people who are looking for ways to be calmer and more grounded. Now most of you know I work with a shaman and he has taught me that our higher intelligence places ideas of health technology in the minds of those who can create and invent these products and i truly believe this to be the case with things like the aura ring the summer vedic even diagnostic devices in hospital and for me i believe that to be true with the sensate we have lived for too long in a high stress state we need more to help us counter that so you can get 20 pounds off the sensate by visiting getsensate.com that's g e T S E N S A T E dot com and using the code Lauren twenty. That's getsensate.com and the code Lauren twenty. Thank you to Sensate for partnering with Reconditioned. And now back to the episode. Yeah, and to go back to what you said about kind of community and you know, it's harder to do it when everyone around you is doing one thing and that seems like the thing and that's how we live and that's how we do and this is our community and this is how our tribe do it. 
it's a bit like the Roger Bannister four minute mile. As soon as you see someone doing something different and you kind of have that support within a different paradigm, it opens up opportunities for you. It's like with anything, you know, I had a conversation with my son's school today and, and we, for, for, since before he was even walking, I was considering home education because the systems don't work for my family. You know, that's, we're out of that. We're out of convention with most things in our life. And yet, you know, trying to juggle that, whatever, that's another story. But like you say, you know, there are good people. The teachers were lovely people trying to help, trying to do their best, giving me solutions, being from talking from their hearts. And I can see that they care. They're in that paradigm. So they don't see the opportunities that could present when you're out of it. And I'm looking at those and seeing what solutions we have. But it's the same within anything, within, you know, medicine as well um so I know that you you mentioned your your program your vital mind reset and I know when this episode airs um that is going to be open for registration so just for anyone listening who is um interested in that program the link is in my bio and I would highly recommend clicking that link and checking it out because as Kelly is saying the whole everything you need that complete comprehensive guide to healing psychiatric uh, would you call it psychiatric challenges or pretty much anything, right? Like a mind. Yeah, I would have initially, right? Because that's what my expertise. But you can't but, actually label it as that. Well, no, no, I'd be happy to. Um, it's just what I discovered is that, you know, because I've published a number of case reports, case series, and on diagnoses like Graves' disease and lupus and asthma and IBS that have nothing to do theoretically with psychiatry, of course, in the conventional mm-hmm. lens where there's like, you know, the head is disconnected from the neck and everything has its own mm-hmm. uh, department. Um, and so I published these cases. I, as far as I know, I published the first case of healing Graves' disease without radiation or surgery in the medical literature. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I, I'm guessing a lot of people just didn't bother to publish it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it's not the first one that happened. Um, so how did, as a psychiatrist, how did I have the opportunity to bear witness to that? Well, because when you create the conditions for your body to regenerate, it does. That's why. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the invitation that your symptoms and maybe your diagnosis are presenting to you are very personal. And there's a very, very personal narrative that it becomes very compelling to unpack. You know, I always think about and get excited about vitamin reset and the groups that go through, because I think about all of the amazing stories that are going to come out the other end. I mean, if you can frame your experience of struggle right now through the lens of narrative, you can meet with your future self and look at your struggle now and know that the most amazing story is coming out of this. You couldn't possibly have written it. So just relax and wait until it reveals itself. Everyone, you're one of these people. I'm one of these people. Look what I have built on the back of my health condition, right? Like on the back of my transformational um, moment. So, you know, I think that the way that this kind of protocol interacts with your story is that it gives you the opportunity to radically change your story and also give meaningful context to why you were struggling. Mm. The struggle, I got really turned on by all of the medical miracles, right? Like the big cases, right? Of like, you know, 18 years of of lupus in remission or uh, a 21 year old with um, schizophrenia on multiple medications, five weeks, he starts to taper his meds for the first time in his adult life. And, you know, these big cases, but then I started to have my friends literally, sign up and do vital mind reset years after it had already been out there. And I was really focused on its role for chronic illness. And that's when I saw, okay, it's not just about psychiatry. It's not just about chronic illness. This is actually a reset. It's just literally a reset for your life. And the field is really big and strong right now. And you just step into that field. And it's something about putting that much time and attention on yourself, on your self-care that sends your nervous system this signal and things begin to unlock because you cannot access expansion when you're in 
survival mode. Your thought patterns are attuned to perpetuating your struggle. So how do you disrupt that? That's what this is. You know, that's, that's what I found. It's like the major disruptor um, because we, we can't get to where we want to go from, you know, the treading water of our current struggles. So how do you make that quantum leap? I think some of the ingredients involve making a bold choice to do things differently, committing to it, and then surrounding yourself by people who also believe that literally anything is possible. And that's why I think the big gains, the big stories are important because you can see anything is possible. If it's possible for them, it's possible for you to feel, you know, to stop losing your hair, feel less bloated and have less joint pain and feel like more positive and optimistic and free in your life path. Totally possible. <laughs> it's very possible, right? So how do you access that? Um, and that's, I think, what this protocol has has ritualized. It's, it's been fascinating um, to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, we, you know, we've got mutual colleagues and friends, and I know people who have been through it, and and how you know the results that come out of it. So, please, you know, anyone listening, make sure to you know go to the show notes and hit that link and um, and join up because it's only open for what six days. Yeah, we have we start well. We have a live experience twice a year, um, and then a self study the rest of the year. And the live experience obviously is is very different. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it start we start on the fourth of October. Amazing. So another question I really want to ask that kind of just came up when you were speaking about um, people on medications, and you know, I've heard for example Gabby Bernstein speaking about her difficulty when she was suffering with postpartum depression and she was raised homeopathically she'd never taken a medication in her life but she was literally suicidal and had this new baby and she says, you know, that this medication for the short term she was on it saved her life and she needed to be on it. Would you say that in that situation even there is a different way that can get you I mean you've got a brand new baby because I'm thinking about the people listening now. Most people listening to this podcast are already kind of on the holistic health path to some degree. But I still think like there will be people listening going, I didn't have a choice or I don't have a choice right now. And I'd love to know your thoughts on that. So I don't have a choice is the anthem of victim consciousness. If that is what you believe, then you belong in the allopathic system. And you will become an ambassador and a champion of that system. That's why should it be any different? There's not a problem there, right? There's, it's not anyone's role, in my opinion, and trust me, I've tried to play this role, to go in to that system and pluck people out of it and save them from themselves. I have become a believer of inspiring through possibility, Right. So I used to, I mean, I have a a book with an exploding pill on the cover, right? And if you want to know that these medications do not do what you've been told they do in the way you've been told they do it, and they are far more dangerous than you will ever be consented about by your prescribing physician. Okay. Then read that book. (laughs) If you want to scare yourself out of ever touching a medication, talk to somebody who has, you know, been put in a wheelchair after taking Clonopin for a year, just trying to come off it, right? Talk to somebody who literally hasn't slept in nine months because they are trying to get off the Zoloft that they took breaking up with their boyfriend in high school 17 years ago. Well, that happened to me. I took methotrexate when I was 18 and it nearly killed me. It, I I only had arthritis in four joints before that. and, And by the end of those 10 months, it was everywhere. I lost half my hair. It damaged my, I mean, it literally nearly killed me. My liver was, you know, just had nearly zero function. Thank God, you know, I've managed to regenerate all of that. But um, wow, you know, I saw the effects of that. I mean, these are poisons. These are literally poisons. They are, but but I'm still, I'm still considering like the people who are postpartum, suicidal, have a baby to think about and feel like they have tried everything and they don't know where to turn. I mean, the reason that Gabby Bernstein's story speaks to me is because she is very holistic. She has been raised homeopathically. She, you know, she uses kind of natural therapies and yet she felt like she had no way out. And so if it's someone like that, there must be other people like that. And then what do we do? We don't do anything. We let them live their life. 
No, you what do they do? Better. What do they do? If someone like that's they're, listening they're right gonna, now. They are going to go to the system because they believe that they don't have a choice. When you know that you have a choice, you always have a choice. No one can take that as your human superpower. No one can take that away from you. So and do you think that even in that level of despair, there is a way out? Without, I, I mean, that's why I've published these cases. I mean, the cases I've published make her story look like a walk in the park. I mean, that's why I was attracted to these extreme cases where I was, you know, literally the last stop before state hospitalization. Right. Okay. So this is not a, just a wellness program, right? This is literally the only thing that worked. For people often who said, I have quote unquote, tried everything. I have tried everything is another way of saying, I am disempowered. I have no choices, right? So the shift comes when you recognize I do have choices. If you choose to medicate yourself, knowing everything there is to know, that's called informed consent, knowing about all of the other choices and knowing the truth about that medication. To my mind, if you know the truth, scientific truth about these medications, you would never bother. I mean, it would like literally wouldn't even make any sense to take one because they don't work in the ways and for the reasons we say they do. And then all you're getting is the adverse effects. Why would you do that? <laughs> right? You would only do that if you think it's the only option. If you know that there are other options, you would pursue them if you thought they were serious, meaning if you thought they would actually work, if you thought they were on par. And then if you knew there were options that actually were not only on par potentially, but had that had myriad side benefits, well, then all the other the other options would would pale, right? That would be the route you would go. You would say, well, I want to feel better and more than better. I want to meet my actual self. I want to get my you know, whole vocational path on track. I want to be inspired to my purpose. I want to look more beautiful, feel more radiant. I want to live a vital life. Okay, yeah, I'll, have, I'll take that track, right? But the, the, the challenge is that to walk through the door onto that track requires that you hold in your body feelings that you have told yourself you will die if you feel these feelings. Mm. It's literally that simple. It's sensations in the body that we have told ourselves we will literally die. So the avoidance of those feelings puts you in a path where the best you can do is to not feel the bad feeling. But what about feeling good feelings, right? What about moving in the direction of feeling good feelings? That's a totally different way of living and being and attracting, right? So the experience of really going in voluntarily, electively through your, your free will to the field of your scariest feelings, what's in there? What's under the bed, right? Where is the boogeyman of your deepest fears? What makes us feel suicidal? What does that even mean? Right. Because when we use these diagnostic terms and we toss them around, assuming we're, we're saying the same thing, we're not. These are all descriptors. I mean, the whole psychiatric Bible is basically like a, a narrative fairy tale. I mean, it, there's there's this is not science in the in the way that people imagine where this is like a validated and quantifiable metric. There's no tests. There's no ways to measure your psychiatric pathology. Right. We just use these descriptive terms and we assume that we're saying the same thing. So to go into the 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 deepest existential fears is to self initiate we don't do that any longer as a culture as a human culture <laughs> you know maybe there are some isolated indigenous um tribes that are still initiating their adolescents we don't do that because we're so busy not feeling the thing because we have been raised by emotionally immature parents who never taught us how to experience the arc of our emotions. What did they do when, when we would cry? Stop crying, calm down, go to your room. Here's a lollipop. We never learned that crying has an arc. It's not persistent in perpetuity. You're not gonna be crying into your deathbed. It's alchemy. We don't have it. 
it's anathema to our consciousness at this point, many of us, what alchemy is, what transformation is. It takes something that seems bad and it turns it into power. It turns it into bliss. It turns it into expans expansion and ecstasy. I mean, this alchemical path is very different than take the bad out, you know, like cut it, burn it, poison it, allopathic consciousness. This is Here's what I've been given. I know it's perfect for me. I know it's a reflection of me. There's nothing to fight here. How do I come with curiosity to what is here and hold myself through this experience and turn it into my next chapter? How do I rebirth myself? That is what I have hundreds of cases to show you comes from not doing the medication thing. You want to do the medication thing, you're going for a different thing. You're shopping for something totally different. So we're not all called to that moment of self-initiation. And some people will die without it, right? They will die children. They will die uninitiated children. And some people will have many, many, many rebirth opportunities in one lifetime. And I have no idea what determines, you know, who's on what track or path. I just know that this is the, the Jungian architecture of individuation. This is what it looks like where the part of you that says, I can't, I have to, that part dies. And then the part of you that knows and trusts that you always can and will is born. That process comes to you through your greatest struggle, your greatest experience of adversity, your greatest fear, death, divorce, loss, illness. Mm -hmm. As a culture, if we reframe this, if we had our elders around us reflecting to us when we felt most afraid, holding us, we would not be in this situation where we are, you know, readily tempted by the fix it magic pill cure. And listen, if it actually did that, that'd be one thing. But unfortunately, there is no fix it magic pill in the entire psychopharmacological arsenal of allopathic medicine. There literally isn't. None of these meds work for the reasons you think they do. They work because of the power of your belief mm -hmm. and because of some basic chemistry that induces toxicity and poisoning that sometimes has an adaptive, adaptive effect, right? Like if you look at antibiotics, you think they're killing all the bad things, right? As if that was the goal. One of the perspectives on how antibiotics works is that they literally kick your adrenals so hard they stress your body so significantly that you output your own steroids and you put like a wash over everything that's occurring. And that's why you feel better. Well, guess what? It's just a matter of time before your body gets back to the business of homeostasis and doing what it was doing to begin with, which is to heal you. <laughs> your body knows how to do that. And when you meddle and you mess with it, and then you think you've done something great for yourself. There's always another way where your body reminds you there's not a way, there's not a shortcut, there's not a way out. It's not built that way because your body doesn't make mistakes. Your symptoms are never actually a problem. They're not the problem. It's deeper. And how do we begin that exploration? We need to be held in the experience of feeling, literally just feeling. Because once you get afraid of your feelings, you're compounding that experience, you're amplifying it. And then the people around you are piling on and you have something so miserable that, yeah, it, it makes sense to imagine pressing the reset button on your life for real, right? But when you have a different framework and you know what's possible, that's why I'm a huge believer in celebrating what is possible because it calls your heart somewhere that you may not have ever known to want to go if you didn't know it's uh, you're talking and i'm thinking of so many people um who i know who are kind of always just that level above that energetic death that they need to go in in order to discover this you know the yeah. illnesses and the depression the anxiety and they're just that step above like they're never fully willing to go into the energetic death because it's too scary so they're ignore it They'll distract themselves from it. They'll medicate from it. And it's like, we can't, we just know that going into it is like you say, you know, and I know for me, it's always been, and, and like you said earlier, sometimes these things, well, not sometimes, but 
when we have to deal with illness and illness comes our way or any of these things that kind of shape up our life, it's always for a reason to kind of help us up level to that next stage. I do have a question and this, this wasn't something I was, um, I'd planned to ask, but just as you're speaking, what are your thoughts on ADHD and autism in terms of how to, I mean, I know, I think I know what you're going to say because I also agree um, with kind of the lifestyle element of it. But, you know, a lot of adults now being diagnosed with ADHD and going down this route of, I finally understand myself now and I'm going to take the medication because it's going to enable me to function in a way I've never been able to function before. And from an allopathic mindset, I understand that these people want this this ability to go into feeling normal, maybe for the first time in their lives. But there is a way out of that also, right? You know, you know what these medications are, right? You know, they're methamphetamine, they're speed, right? They're, th- this is just the very, very fine line of where uh, allopathic physicians are essentially licensed drug dealers. <laughs> and that, I mean, listen, hey, I, I have a very libertarian perspective on, on life. I am not here to tell anybody what to do, what drugs to take, what not to take, you know, do, do you, what I find problematic is when you're not given the full story. And the good news is that the full story exists now, you know, like even, even with censorship and even with like all of the ways that, um, the information has been controlled it's still accessible. You can still find it. You can still read books about the truth. And it comes back down to this same point of inquiry we've already been discussing, which is, do you want to insist that something should work that doesn't work, right? When you feel suicidal, when you cannot concentrate, when you are not productive in your life, there is something that you are insisting should work And then you are blaming yourself, your chemistry, your genes, whatever it is, for the fact that it doesn't. But it's a mismatch. It's a misalignment. Right? Mm -hmm. And there are, there is woundology that is keeping you in, in entrapped in that dynamic where you're saying, okay, well, this is how it is. This job, this partner, you know, this diet, (laughs) you know, this dynamic with my children, like all, this is just how it is. And I should feel a certain way. And I don't, I should function in a certain way. And I don't, what if there is something that is, that is so ill configured about your life? What if there's a relationship that needs to end? You know, what if there is an entirely new pair? What if your kids shouldn't be in school, right? What if they should be in school? What if there is some massive change that needs to happen that will render you actually a perfect fit? And then you'll feel totally well and ignited and inspired. But what happened to your faulty chemistry then, right? When you change the context and you change the environment and the symptoms go away, then it wasn't ever you to begin with, right? So why would you medicate yourself as if you are the problem when it is a mismatch with the context? It's a mismatch with the environment. This is what we are doing. We are living in all sorts of misaligned ways. And you could go to, down the futility path and say, well, what are we supposed to do about it? Like, this is just how it is. Fine. I know plenty of people who are living vital lives in this totally messed up society, right? And have found a way to prioritize the meeting of their most essential human needs rather than conformity to expectations of a lifestyle that, that was handed down to them from their parents individuating from our families of origin is the most essential piece of reclaiming your capacity to envision and imagine your most expanded life. We don't have a paradigm for that, right? We don't know what that even means. Most of us are still enmeshed with our parents, whether they're living or dead. And we have this appeasement program going on where we project our parents all over the place and we're hoping, hoping, hoping people like us and approve of us. And, and then we get triggered and then we get upset and we, you know, try to punish and defy, you know, the, the bad mommy or, or, you know, daddy projection. And we're in this loop of struggle. And that's why I've come to, to find that at least the practice in my life is in the reclamation of choice, which I mentioned is 
the superpower of the adult um, is to to say no to things, to to fire people, to leave relationships, to you know end contracts, um, to not attend things, right? Uh, end relationships and friendships, to say no to things, even when someone hasn't done something wrong. And even when I don't think that they're bad. (laughs) So how can I not require those two things to be in place in order to access my power? Then I really have the freedom of choice, right? Because if I don't need people to be bad and wrong in order for me to identify that they're not a fit for me, that something is not working here, that compatibility is not present for the meeting of my needs, which I will meet no matter what my needs must be met. So I'm going to meet my needs either directly or indirectly, manipulatively and strategically. You know, I'm going to self-medicate all of my pain of my unmet needs, or I'm going to say, okay, here's actually what I need. And I'm going to move in this direction of, you know, the courageous walk into the wild unknown until I find the thing that feels like home. I find the thing that feels like, oh, this is what I didn't even know was possible, but on some level I had faith it would come. And so that um, is the ultimate resolution. I think of victim consciousness is when we can get to this place where we don't judge and we don't blame, including our experiences, right? Where everything is just, wow, that is interesting. And that doesn't mean we don't feel grief and shame and fear. It means we hold it as a part of us that is experiencing that. And that's why I'm so passionate about um, parts work as a modality, therapeutic modality, because you come to relate to these huge emotional experiences as just a a compendium of parts that are orchestrating something that has caught your attention. It's not all of you. It's just parts of you. And there's not bad ones we want to eradicate. They're all here to serve you, literally. The feelings, the managers, they're called, right? The, The protectors, they're all there. Uh, in service of you. And they just haven't done the memo that now you're in your forties and, you know, you're not a six-year-old who who can't walk out the door, right? It's, it's different now as an adult. They've heard you say um, about never punishing your kids. You never punish your kids. And this is something I just, I want to understand more. Um, And I know a lot of people get a lot from this and how you manage that when it's something that's dangerous or you know my kids are really little at the moment and my son barely listens to anything I say how do you manage kind of not doing you know even I'm going to go with you to your room and sit in your room with you just so that you can calm down like how do you actually manage no reaction to that at all well listen um I was a pretty absent mother in my workaholic days in my children's early life and I had my parents, have my parents, um, to create more of a village experience for my girls. So my girls now are tweens, right? And I really showed up on the scene um, spiritually and emotionally, I would say when they were probably like six-ish and and up, right? Um, So, and I have girls, right? So I know it's different, I'm sure. Um, I, because this is the practice that I am in my reparenting, engaging with myself, which is my feelings are always valid. They are always welcome. And I'm not going to talk myself out of my feelings. I'm not going to distract myself from my feelings. And I'm going to grow my capacity to observe the arc of a feeling when I attend to it, right? Which is honestly on the order of minutes. Right. So how would I offer that same, you know, presence to my girls? So when my girls have an issue, and this is not easy, trust me, like even the other day, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. And it's, it's a, it's a higher level commitment that you make, right? So when your child is doing something that you don't want them to be doing, and they're doing it in a particularly boisterous way, emotionally, right? How can you remember Oh, this is how I break the cycle. Mm. I put my shit aside. I'm the adult. 
I don't try to convince them that I'm right, that my reality is the dominant one. Just, just, just don't do that for a minute. Okay. Exercise the self-control and willpower as the adult, which again, is not available to you until you have done a modicum of this healing. It's like literally not available to you. So this is one of the many side benefits of beginning this, this process, which starts with healing your nervous system. And then you simply show up with super simple language, language and you mirror and you validate. You're angry that I want you to go to the store and you'd want to go. Oof, you're angry. You're wow. You're really, you're really angry. Literally like that. That's all you say. Mm. There's nothing to fix. And you will find, <laughs> not you, but I'm, one will find, you know, that that validation. Yeah, I am. Great. Now you're on the same team. <laughs> now you're on the same team again, right? Because that validation goes so far and it is very hard to offer because we are used to defending our reality and imagining that if we give up the post to someone else, we're going to be subsumed and destroyed. That's old woundology, right? And now you're an adult. You can visit with the terrain of your child's experience and not have to bring yours. Like it's still going to be there when you go back. Don't worry. Right. And so this, these basic practices of empathically validating very, very simply, I think go a really, 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 really long way. Um, honestly, I can't even Im imagine, like you get to a place where like punishment is like weird. It's like medication. It's like, why, mm. why, like, what does that have to do with anything? Mm. If like, because that would mean that I have a, a power over rule that they don't agree to. And again, you know, my kids are tweens, so it's potentially very different now. Um, but they don't agree to, and they don't want to comply with all of our our parameters and boundaries. We agree upon. Now there are some exceptions, right? Where I do, I have only certain kinds of food in the house because well, they don't go shopping. We don't have like you know, I don't know. Kellogg's and pizza, you know, like, so that is not something I offered up for discussion. This is how we eat. You know, this is, this is the way it goes. And I do my best to help them understand my perspective and why it is that we eat that way. And honestly, like because of their level of vitality and healthfulness and some of the folks that, that are in their lives that don't live this lifestyle, they get it. Like they really do get it. And they're, they don't need resist at all. Um, but everything else, like technology, that's a really challenging one. All of mm. our rules about technology are agreements. They're all agreements and they're self-enforced. So they enforce the, the agreement. Otherwise it's not an agreement, right? Otherwise it's a top-down rule. And then I, me and the technology are colluding against my kid, right? Where, when you're using the technology as a reward and a punishment, that's mm. a very, very slippery slope. It's very easy to fall into that, obviously. Um, and I think that you set up a paradigm that is just like a kind of a kind of a help, right? So how can we be on the same team appreciating that this is a tool to be used and that's not going to be using us? How do we set the conditions up for that? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. And then disputes, you know, like they, they have their things and typically like the three of us will sit down and I'll hear one's perspective and I'll hear the other's perspective and I'll, we'll time it. And then I'll say, you know, what can you take responsibility for and what can you offer, you know, to your sibling? Um, and it's very easy for them. Like, at, you know, at, at their age, they, they're just, our children are our spiritual, like, masters. I mean, that's really the, the, the big dupe, right? It's like, oh, we yeah. think that we're here to teach them. My kids are so yeah. much more evolved. I, can, I can't, <laughs> my daughter's first relationship at 13 makes every single relationship I have ever been in look dysfunctional and unhealthy. Literally at 13, mm. she, she literally could be teaching me about emotional intelligence yeah. and health in, in dynamic relating. So when we get out of the, the way of our kids, they, they express the full breadth of their spiritual attunement that they came in with. It's when we corrupt that. I mean, right. Like we, we meddle with that. We intervene and we 
we impose this this antiquated energetic dynamic of, of hierarchy on these beings. I mean, it's it's really you know then they'll spend the rest of their life on doing it the way we did. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's that's the challenge here, isn't it? Like you know, allow, allow raising our kids so that they don't have to do the amount of inner child healing <laughs> that we have to do. And I agree with you in terms of them being our teachers. My kids know themselves better at six and three. Yep. That I only knew myself like that, like in my mid thirties. So, <laughs> you know, and they like know themselves. They're so just clear on who they are. Okay. Uh, rapid fire round all about you. First one is always the same and the other four are tailored to you. So wellness is. Freedom. Hmm. Very pertinent to everything we've just spoken about. Um, I think I know based on what we've just spoken about, what your answer is going to be, but your most profound piece of advice for parents. Remember what it felt like mm. to be a kid. Mm. Most profound piece of advice for those suffering with psychiatric or mental health conditions. What you have been told is wrong with you is the source of your greatest gift. Mm, that's beautiful. Uh, a question you ask yourself the most. Can I really be certain about that? And lastly, what are you reading right now? Oh God, like seven books. My stack is really um, concerning. Um, I am about to finish a book on family constellation. Mm. Um, and I, I don't want to butcher the title. I think it's connected fates. I'm going to have to tell you, I don't, I don't want to butcher it. And it's an amazing book. So I'm going to send you, I'm going to yeah, send, send you it to me and I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Perfect, perfect, perfect. That's it. That's a, a bit embarrassing because it's a, like a passionate, um, subject that I am very, very excited to share more about. Um, I've done a number, number, number of family constellations this year and they've absolutely changed my life. So. This is a really, really good. It's one of the only books, actually. Um, Someone actually asked me if I knew anyone that did that the other day. So that's really interesting that that came up. Yeah, it's very big here in Miami. There's a number of people who do it. I actually think it's probably if you look, um, you can find it, at, you know, internationally anywhere. Mm. Okay. Kelly, thank you so much. I've loved this so much. As usual, you are just a beacon of knowledge and expertise and just a new way of thinking always. Every time I listen to you, I hear you, I watch you. It's just, you're teaching me something brand new. So once again, for anyone listening, please visit the link in the bio for in, in the show notes for um, Kelly's Vital Mind Reset, which is just open now. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, I found the book. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yes, Connected <laughs> Fates, Connected Fates, Separate Destinies. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm Marie and Salonay. Yes, it's an amazing book. So I just wanted right. to I honor, honor sure that. To... Sorry, that didn't feel right. I okay. will make sure to put that in the show you. notes. Thank you, Thank Kelly. You. Lots of love. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Reconditioned. I am honestly so grateful to each and every person that tunes in. Thank you also for taking responsibility for your own well-being. You should know that just by choosing to listen to podcasts like this that further your well-being, you're moving more deeply into abundance consciousness. Now, don't forget, I have a bunch of free resources over at laurenbacknean.co.uk, as well as every recommendation you could ever need in regards to your well-being on the LV Recommends page, all categorized for your ease. Thank you also to our sponsors. These episodes would not be possible without them, so make sure to check them out and get some pretty awesome discounts on the show notes. And of course, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast so that you can get updated each time a new one is released. Thank you. I appreciate Appreciate you. Reconditioned is proud to be working with Women for Women International, a charity that supports women survivors of war in eight war-torn countries around the world. You can help a woman survivor of war transform her life today by visiting womenforwomen.org.uk forward slash donate.